good morning. I am sure you're like me. That you want to, you know, shout it from the rooftops. He is a good, good, good father. And praise God uh, for that. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Matt, uh, taking a little bit of uh, rest with the family after a, a busy uh, 13 weeks. And so just remember them uh, in your prayers. Now, I know Matt has been going through a series of messages that he entitled Endgame, dealing with end time events, uh, book of Revelation, book of Daniel. Uh, I'm not going to continue in that. He'll continue as he uh, comes back. But I want to do deal a little bit on uh, our reaction or how we are to live in light of difficult times. I know a lot of times I used to, when I was a young Christian, we hear believers uh, speak about, well, we're never going to go through any difficult times because uh, God was going to make sure that as a Christian, as his children, we're going to be gone from this earth before anything bad happens. Uh, let me say this, all right? Not necessarily true. Things are going to get bad. We won't be here for the great tribulation, all right? And praise God for that. But uh, as the stage is set for what's going to happen, difficult times are going to come. In fact, I, I don't want to depress you this morning. If you think things are bad now, wait a little bit, all right? But it's going to become difficult. So what I want to deal with is about how do you walk, you know, in those times as a Christian, when times are difficult, all right? You know, it's easy when everything's going your way, you know, I mean, uh, nobody's giving you a difficult time. You got money in your wallet. I mean, the kids are behaving. Uh, the wife or husband, I mean, it's good. Everything is wonderful. Man, it's easy to live for God. But how about when everything falls apart, right? And you're persecuted for your faith. And that's what we're going to deal with. The message I'm going to give you this morning, God gave me when I was in Ghana, my last mission trip to there uh, this um, uh, April, really had a difficult, difficult time. And I'll give you the, really make you laugh on this, that how God, God preached this message to me, all right? The heat index over there was over 110. I'm a little bit like Matt, but Matt's even beyond me, all right? I don't even have the fans on, all right? But uh, very, very hot. It was the hottest time. In fact, they were setting records over there. So I'm laying in my cot, trying to get, wondering how I'm going to do what needs to be done. I have a towel. I mean, it was like, you wouldn't want to see how I look like. Wet, you know, all my head and everything else. And God spoke to me about this scripture and literally gave me this message that I wrote this message in a notebook I always carry with me sitting on the side of this cot with a wet towel on my head, no shirt, and writing it out. All right? That's the message you're getting, all right, this morning. All right? But again, God was trying to really encourage me. You can do this, Bill. Even in the midst of difficult times, you can do a strong walk. You can live out what you believe. So keep that in mind. Let me read, all right, chapter 2, first 13 verses. Paul's writing... Uh, to Timothy. Paul's in a Roman prison. Let me give you a little background. It's on, I think, the introduction there. Uh, it was written to Timothy, who was his son in the Lord. That means he had a part in Timothy coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. But Timothy is a man who is living in fear. Times are difficult, all right? There a lot of persecution going on. That's why Paul's in prison. And Timothy sees Paul but he sees himself. And what he sees when he looks at himself, he sees a person who was weak. He sees a person who was inferior. I'm not an apostle Paul. I'm less than him. And uh, he sees himself as a person, you know, I'm not really up for what's coming my way. All right? I can't stand, all right, up to the persecution as Paul stood up. And uh, like I said, he sees himself as no apostle Paul. Familiar verse in chapter 1. All right, tells us about really how he, the spirit Timothy had. He had a spirit of fear, all right? He had a spirit of powerlessness. In other words, I don't have the power to meet, all right, what I have to face in life. He has faulty thinking, all right? He catastrophizes everything, all right? Keeps on mulling over negative and negative thoughts in his mind. And everything is centered around himself, all right? And, of course, he sees himself as weak, all right? And as opposition is growing, all right, a lot of opposition against the early church, all right, 
All these battles, these thoughts in Timothy's mind are raging. And he enter, as he entertains these thoughts, what happens? He's pulling back. And you remember, he's a minister. He's supposed to be a leader, right? And he is going, you know what? <laughs> I don't think this can be done. I don't think I'm the man. And Paul is writing for prison, all right? Encouraging Timothy, trying to get his thinking back in line with God's truth. And a lot of times that's what we need, all right? I know when I was at the mission trip and was the one that caught him, how in the world am I going to do this, right? And God, praise God, he's a good, good father, comes along and sort of gives us that adjustment, all right? So listen to what Paul tells him in chapter 2. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore, Timothy, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is the faithful saying. For if we dine with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that as we go into your word, dear Lord, that you would take the truths that you had the Apostle Paul encourage Timothy with so many years ago, that these would be the truths that would encourage us. I pray, dear Lord, that we would not only hear them, but, dear Lord, that they would be implanted within our very spirit, our very soul, very heart. Dear Lord, that we may see ourselves able to walk the walk, to live the faith, no matter what the times may bring. Dear Lord, may you be glorified in everything that is done, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you three things, all right? God pointed these out to me as I was, like I said, on that cot over there in Ghana. And really, the truths that the Apostle Paul pointed out to Timothy. Number one, Timothy, you need to see Jesus Christ as the source of your strength. Get your eyes off yourself, all right? Your abilities, your strength, whatever or whoever you think you are. And get your eyes on Jesus Christ. See him as the source of your strength. Verse 1, all right? Timothy needs to see himself as strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. These are the same words that Paul spoke to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, where he said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, you notice what he did not say, all right? He didn't say, Timothy, listen, you need to get up. Stop wallowing in self-pity. Be strong in yourself. Man, you can do it. In other words, you have power, you have strength, you have abilities. See yourself as able to meet any challenge that is coming against you. That isn't what he told them. You know why? I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how many abilities that you ha have, your strength will fail you in life. It will fail you. And uh, I was, you know, God get, was giving this message to me. I was going over to Ghana. Now, when you become older, when you're going to go on a mission trip and you know it's going to be difficult, you see every doctor. And as you get older, man, you have all the specialists, right? 
So I did it all, man. I made sure, you know, I was my urologist. I was my medical doc. Everyone, right? You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. All right? So I'm good. I have everything lined out. I'm able to do this. I, I directed a passion play for 25 years. I've been in ministry going over there. I can handle this. I've got the team. Everything's going to be great. So I'm in the plane, and the plane is starting to descend, right? We're ready now to make our initial descent. So I take out my handkerchief, and I blow my nose. All of a sudden, blood is pouring out all over. I'm going, what? And I've never had nosebleeds. Huh? What in the world is going on, right? So I'm thinking I can stop this. But no matter what I did, couldn't stop it. I mean, the stewardess were coming to me. I'm not used to anybody coming to me, right? And it ends up, they're coming to me, man, with ice cubes and everything else. I mean, lean your head back, put your head forward, pinch this, do that. I mean, everything in the world they're telling me to do. And guess what? It was still bleeding, all right? Plane landed. Everybody's getting off the plane. Here I am. I went, what in the world? I got things to do. <laughs> I can't mess with this. I'm, I'm like, I wanted to will it. Stop bleeding those. Didn't work, all right? And ends up, everybody's off, and I'm getting out. People try to help me. I don't need your help. Man, come on. I'm 6'2", man. I can take care of it, right? I'm getting out. I'm getting a little wobbly. They have a wheelchair. They're meeting me there at the plane. I don't need no wheelchair. Almost went down. I needed the wheelchair. Now, you're in Africa, and all of a sudden, they're wheeling you in a wheelchair, all right, through the airport. Where are you taking me, <laughs> all right? They put me in an ambulance, all right? Oh, I go, man, we're in trouble now, all right? They took me to the clinic. It was uh, traveling back to the 1950s, all right? Doctor asked the nurse for a light. Hands her, or she hands him, her cell phone. Try this. Okay, all right? They're trying to stop it. I was in that room for about four hours, and my, my brain is racing. I don't want to be here. I got things I got to do. And all of a sudden I said, man, I'm in problems, <laughs> all right? All right, well, let's try to do this, asking me all these questions and everything else. But it was in the midst of there that, you know, it's almost that like God came to me, all right? Not saying this moment, but like he came to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Bill. Just take it easy. And literally, I don't even need you to get this ministry done. What? Right? <laughs> in other words, it's not your strength. It's my strength. See, I'm saying there's going to come times in life when you're, you're prepared. I mean, everybody, tell, you're in the greatest health. You can do this and everything. Else. And then the bottom falls out. Right? And I'm saying that those times, God is your strength. All right? It was true for the Apostle Paul, and it's going to be true for Timothy. All right? That our strength is going to fail us. And Timothy thinks, you know, that unfortunately, he thinks that Paul is some kind of superhero, right? And so I got to be the superhero. No, all right? What he has to do is look to Christ, not his own strength, not his own abilities. It's through him, all right, that we are able to accomplish what God's will is. And it's amazing, and I don't know if you caught this when I was reading this, Paul stressed to Timothy a couple things about God's power. Number one, God's power is resurrection power. Look at verse 8. He ends up telling him that Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, was what? Raised from the dead. In other words, if you want power, all right? All right, let me tell you the index of power. In the Old Testament, the index of God's power was the nation of Israel going through the Red Sea. You know what the index of power is for us today? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, the power of God is able to conquer death. So Bill, or Timothy... A nosebleed is nothing to God, all right? I mean, God is able to conquer the grave. Timothy, forget about feeling sorry for yourself, all right? Don't look at your weaknesses and limits, but look to Jesus Christ whose strength has no limits. Wherever the will of God is going to call you, the grace of God is going to be able to provide what you need. And that's what Timothy needed to hear. Also, he goes on in verse 9, he talks about the Word of God not being chained. And literally what that means is that in God's power, there was no obstacle, you understand, that can come against God to keep His will from being accomplished. 
See, we can face obstacles, walls that come in our life, and we're going to throw up our hands and say, you know what? I'm not going to be able to do what I plan. God never throws up his hands. There is no obstacle. There is nothing that comes against God that he is not able to accomplish his will and his purpose. And Paul is telling Timothy, see yourself in Jesus Christ. See your strength in him. It will become. And it's amazing. You know, in that trip, all right, Bill had his whole plan out, right? Because we were going to transition this passion play to the people of Ghana that they would be able to do it yearly, all right, as an evangelistic outreach over there. And so my plan was the people I had, they would be in the main roles and we would take care, we would get them prepared and then we would do it uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then I would transition them, all right, into Saturday and Sunday, Sunday being uh, Palm Sunday. What ended up happening, the man who was playing Jesus gets sick. I go, what in the world? All right. So I ended up, I had to go to this young man over there in Ghana and say, guess what? It's not Saturday. It's tonight. <laughs> right? And it ended up, but I'm saying, but God in his wisdom knew on Sunday night, we had, I mean, a monsoon <laughs> over there. All right. And we weren't able to do the play on that night, but God had it orchestrated that we were able to accomplish the transition. He had it done earlier so everything would be taken care of. And so I'm saying, you know what? It's not wrong making plans. And God has given us all abilities and strengths and talents. But I'm saying, if you look at those for your strength, all right, in the days ahead, you're going to, you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be disappointed. But we need to look to him. And that's what the Apostle Paul was telling Timothy. Timothy, you don't got to be no superhero. You don't got to be another Apostle Paul. You just be who God made you, Timothy, and you be strong in the power of his might. And so number one, he was telling Timothy, Timothy, see Christ as the source of your strength. Then also in that part of the letter, he says, Timothy, you got to remember five continuing needs in your life. If you're going to have the power of Christ flow through you, there's five things that you need to continue to do in your life throughout your life. As long as you live, all right, and you're going to serve him. And notice what he said. The first one, you need to see the need of lifelong discipleship. That means, guess what? You grow as a Christian for your life. It's not you become 65 and you retire and you know everything there is about the Christian life. You need continuing discipleship. Look in the beginning of verse 2. He says, the things you heard from me among many witnesses. See, Paul discipled Timothy. In fact, what Paul is doing right now, Paul is discipling Timothy. We need to understand Christ is our master discipler, but he uses other people in our life to disciple us. And we are being discipled as a believer, whether we understand it or not, 24-7. God is bringing events. God is bringing people in our life to disciple us that we would be more like Christ. And there's three L's that I always remind myself and that we need to be reminded of. Every day we are to look, we are to listen, and we are to learn. We are to look at what God is doing around us, what is touching us. We are to learn, all right, the lessons that we can learn, all right, that People are pouring into our lives. The circumstances are pouring into our life. And we need to learn those lessons and apply them to our life. Discipleship is never over. He's not, Timothy, just keep on learning. And I have to remember that. Whether you're 72, whether you're 17, all right? Discipleship is a lifelong process. Number two, notice what he says at the end of verse two. He says, those things that you're learning, what do you need to do with them? You need to commit them to who? Faithful men who are able to teach others also. I call that the need of multiplication. See, I need to invest in other people if ministry is going to go on. See, like on a mission trip, it's not about Bill going over there and I'm able to do this, this, and this. I need to train people that they are able to do ministry when I am what? Gone. 
We are to multiply ourselves. We not only need to be discipled, but I need to be discipling others. All right? In other words, discipleship is not a one-way ministry. In other words, discipling others is the only way for ministry to be done. We have too many people, I think, sometimes they see themselves as a solo act. All right? I'm going to live the Christian life, all right? And I'm doing my thing. It's never meant to be a solo act. In fact, I challenge you, read through the epistles in the New Testament. You cannot live the Christian life by yourself. Most of the commands of the Word of God are dealt with in relationships. And in order to really obey them and to live within those commands, I need to be in relationships. I need people in my life. That's the way it's meant to be. And you need to ask yourself, who are you discipling? And God, see, I was over there and I was thinking, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. And God said, no, Bill, you got to pour yourself in others that they would be able to do it. And we have to ask ourselves, who am I discipling? Who am I really pouring myself into that ministry will go on when I leave this world? So Timothy need to, needs to see the need of multiplication. Then there's another need. Look at verse 3. He says, therefore you must, man, look at that word there, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I got to see the need of endurance. See, sometimes you just need to endure the place where God has you. That's his will. That you don't throw up your hands and want to run out of that valley. You just endure and trust God that he's going to bring you through that valley and that there's a purpose for you being in it. And he's saying to Timothy, you know, you're going to experience hardships. There's going to be times you're tired. There's going to be times you feel like there, there is no way out. You're drained. And the truth is, if I read the Bible right, there are times God will not deliver you from hardship. He will allow you to stay in that valley. He will allow you to stay in that opposition. He will allow you to stay in that difficult time. Because he has something that he wants you to learn. And what we need to do in the midst of that is endure. And we believe in God. He will give me the grace and power to do it. Now, again, I don't like heat. I went over there to Ghana, and I knew it was going to be hot in March. But I did not, it got the hot time of the year, but I did not expect it to be setting records. All right? And so I'm there the first day after the bout, you know, what ended up happening at the nosebleed. They couldn't get my blood pressure down. They were wondering why it was high. I said, why? I have no reason. I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding profusely in the plane, taking me in a wheelchair, taking me to this clinic back in the 40s. Why would my blood pressure be high, right? And they couldn't get it down. So, and, uh, so I'm there, you know, at, at that mission. I'm hot. I mean, it's like tower. I'm how in the world am I going to do this? Man, I have like three times a day, Andrea, who's the, one of the directors, they're taking my blood pressure, right? One minute's up, one minute's down, uh, and everything else. But God spoke to me, Bill, just one day at a time, one hour at a time. And guess what? I was able to make it one day at a time, and everything that God desired, all right, for that trip was accomplished. Isn't that what life is? If we look too far ahead, we panic. Or am I right? We go, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can meet that need. But guess what? I don't got to meet what's coming tomorrow. I'm in today. And the truth of it is, after 72 years, I realize I have a tough time handling today. I can't take on tomorrow. Sufficient to the day is the what? The evil thereof. It's one day at a time. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, stop catastrophizing everything. All right? Just endure, and God will be faithful. Then there's another need he has. Notice what he says in verse 4. No one engaged in warfare... And he's saying the Christian life is what? You're in a war. Guess what? 
War is tough. All right? It's not easy. He said, but no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. He says, Tim, you need to get refocused. All right? It's not, you're in a warfare, and warfare is not about your ease and your comfort. You know, it's like your sergeant isn't come. Are you comfortable enough? Are you cool enough? Do I need to take some things out of your backpack, you know, make it easier? They're not going to do that. Am I right? You're going to have to buckle up under the pressure. He says, he's telling him, you need to be focused. We have the tendency to lose focus in life. I don't know if you're like me, right? It's like things come in the midst of a struggle and the routines of life, and we just, poof, I'm in a different direction, all right? And we lose focus. We can't lose focus. Satan and our fleshly nature constantly attempts to distract us to get our focus off the Lord and our focus on me. See, in the song we want to sing is the PLM's Poor Little Me. Nobody has it as bad as me, God. I mean, in all the history of the world, you just, I mean, nobody understands what I'm going through. My, tell me, I mean, I sing that to God, and you think about God listening to that. And he's telling Timothy, get your mind off yourself. Remember, you are here not to be comfortable and to please yourself. You are here, all right, to please him who is your commander. See, and I was Timothy, and I see this a lot in the Christian life today. We want to make Christianity revolve around us. God bless me. God help me to feel good, God, this and everything else. It's like everybody's praying, God, you do this all for me. But guess what? The Christianity is about my life revolving around who? Him, His will. It's not that God is pleasing me by doing for me everything I want. It's that my focus is on Him, all right, and that I'm living in such a way that brings Him honor and glory. See, my focus can't be on this world of earthly pursuits. Our focus can't be on my ease and my comfort. i got to remember, there's a verse in the Bible in the book of Hebrews. Moses. Remember Moses, man? My, I mean, he was raised, you talk about in a great setting. He had the best education you could get. He was raised in the palace of Pharaoh. Man, he had all the money that you would want, power. He had everything going for him. And he forsook it all. Ended up 40 years on the backside of a desert. How did he endure and then you talk about 40 years leading the nation of Israel, right? Stiff-necked people that no matter what, they can't. Can you imagine having a million and a half people lining up at your door every day to complain to you? <laughs> I mean, just think about it, right? And it ends up, there's a verse in Hebrews 11:27 that says this. He, Moses, endured as seeing him who was invisible. Only way he was able to endure, he had to see God. See, the only way you're going to endure some days in life is by keeping your focus on Him. Some days are unbearable in your family. Marriage, kids, job. Come on, let's be honest, right? And you just have to endure and keep your focus, what, on Him. And that's what he's telling Timothy. He can't promise Timothy, hey, Timothy, you're never going to end up in a prison cell like me. You're never going to be beat like me. You're never going to be shipwrecked like me. He can't promise Timothy that. Any pastor that comes to you and promises those things is lying to you, all right? He's telling them, I can't promise you that. But I can promise you, you can endure whatever comes your way by the grace of God if your focus is on him. And that's what he's telling me. You've got to remember that, Timothy. Because you're, you're going to end up, your focus is going to get off and you need to get refocused. It's almost like a car, right? You've got to get realigned every once in a while. You've got to get your focus. Every day, you've got to get your focus on him. And the last thing he needs to remember out of those five, look at verse 5. He needs to learn the need of submission. He says, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to what? The rules. i got to daily submit myself to the Lord and His Word and His will. I mean, this, this is the guidebook. This is the instructions. See, we have a lot of people today, and you hear that even the Christians, well, I know what God's Word says, but here's what I feel. 
Can you imagine me, man, I'm running the Olympics? Well, I know what the rule book says for the Olympics and, the, you know, the 400 meter, but this is what I feel. You know what they would tell me? doesn't matter what you feel. You violated the rules. You're not eligible for a medal. All right? I'm saying I need to compete according to the rules. We need not only to finish the race, but I got to finish it well. How do you finish the race, the Christian life, well? By competing according to the rules by God's holy word, step by step. I got to humble myself before God. See, sometimes, I don't, you ever, when you read certain stuff like rules and instructions, and you don't understand, I don't even know why they're there, right? I can skip step two or three. And then when you're done the project, oh yeah, should have done step two and three. I'm in a problem here, right? And, and sometimes I don't even understand why I, everything God t- tells me what I need to do, I, I don't understand it. It doesn't matter what I understand or not. See, God will never explain everything to me. There's never been a time in heaven. I used to hear preachers think of time in heaven, God's going to sit you down and explain everything. Uh, God's not going to explain everything to you and I, all right? He is God. I am not, all right? And I have to trust him, and I submit myself to his word. And that's what he's telling Timothy. Just submit yourself, Timothy. Don't panic. So there's five things he needs to keep in mind. So Timothy needs to see Jesus Christ, source of your strength. Keep these five continuing needs in your mind. And then remember the joy that's before you. See, it's a joy to be a Christian. I really believe that. And Timothy, he's looking, he's looking at the downside. You know, there's some people that no matter how good things are, they find something to complain about, right? Those are the VDPs, very depressing people, all right? And that's what Timothy is. He's looking at all, I mean, in other words, I know everything's going well, but, all right, here's what's happening. And uh, he needs to stop looking at the downside. And Paul mentions some things he needs to see, we all need to see. Notice what he says in verse 6. He said, the hardworking farmer must be first to be a partaker of the crop. You know what that means? If I'm a farmer and I'm tending my trees out there, I don't know what you say, a peach orchard. Fruit doesn't ripen, at least it never did for me, all at the same time. And there's that first peach that ripens on your tree or the first tomato on the bush. Guess who? I don't, guess, I don't take that and give it to my neighbor. All right? That's mine. <laughs> all right? And I take that and I enjoy that peach, tomato, what, whatever that it is. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy... Don't forget you have the reward of first fruits, all right? Now, follow what I'm going to say. A lot of us in life, we have a destination mindset. What, what that means is, is that we're living our lives, well, I'm eventually down there, I'm going to retire at 65, and then I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going here, there, and everywhere else. Problem is, sometimes you don't get to 65, right? Or that when I graduate college, you enjoy life as the journey. Every day, every moment is a precious gift that God has given you. And what Paul was telling Timothy, you're looking at the downside. You need to understand there are some results of ministry you're going to see here and now. You know, most of the results we'll see in heaven. But God sometimes gives us a glimpse of what he's doing. You're involved in teen ministry. And I know I do with teens. Teens usually don't let you see too much. All right? But occasionally they do. Because sometimes a lot of teen and people involved in teen ministry, they get depressed because you wonder, am I doing it? Is anything working, all right? Am I getting through, right? I don't know if you've ever said that, all right? But then occasionally something, somebody says something, you go, whoa, God's at work, right? And that's what he's telling Timothy here, all right? You look at some things that are going on in your life. We get the taste of the first fruits, all right, with the hope of upcoming fruits, I saw that in God now. I was thinking all oh, the, you know, I got to do this, this, and this. And all of a sudden, one day, got pushed right in my front. I had three kids, and I call them kids, they're like 19, that were in the play. In fact, one of them was Pilate. Man, they were doing a great job. One of them was Pilate, one was Satan, all right? And uh, I was kind of talking with them. You know, man, I mean, you're doing a great job in your ministry and everything. Oh, yeah, I was 10 years old. I was 8 years old. When you first came to God and I got saved in the ministry of Bible school and everything else, and now they're in the play. And I'm going, whoa. 
that these kids you invest in their life are now involved in ministry. Sometimes God gives that to us. But so, can I say this? Sometimes we are so busy in our downward spiral that we miss what God's doing around us. And understand there's another truth. God is always at work. He's always at work. Don't get so busy you don't see the blessings of life, what God's doing, whether in your kids or whether people that are around you. So Timothy, don't miss those blessings. Then also he tells in verse 10, you have the anticipated harvest of souls saved. In verse 10 he says, Therefore I endure, Paul saying, all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may attain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He said, one day we're going to find ourselves in heaven and we're going to end up see the results of what ministry we had. And there's going to be many surprises waiting for us in heaven. Have you ever had people, and I've had in my life, that you try to witness to, you sow the seed and you pray for them, and it seems like they never, I mean, I mean they're not going to respond. They reject you, shut you down and everything else, right? And then, you know, there's going to be some of those folks that you're going to bump in heaven. Whoa! You got saved? <laughs> it's, it's like you're, you're here? In other words, it's, there's going to be surprise. See, we think if we don't see immediate results, things aren't going to happen. Am I right? In other words, I, it's like I'm planting a garden. When I plant the seeds, I'm out there the next day. Okay, pop up, pop up, pop up. But you understand, God sometimes has a longer... <laughs> All right, range, uh, time span in what he is doing. There's going to be a lot of surprise. You're going to think that sometimes you wasted time on a person's life, and you're going to be, whoa, when you see what God has done. There's going to be those there who we sowed the seed, maybe we watered along the way, never thought that it ever took any effect. And boom. <laughs> Where's going to be a lot of rejoicing in heaven? He says, Timothy, your service is not in vain. Because sometimes what we think is that... Why am I doing this? It's going nowhere. It doesn't mean anything. Don't buy into that lie, Paul's telling Timothy. Then the last thing, look at verse 12. He says, if we endure, the next phrase says, we shall also reign with him. You have the rewards for eternity. Nothing that you do here on this earth goes unnoticed in heaven. God says no labor is in vain. It says we're going to reign with him. See, sometimes we got this idea that we get to heaven, we're, you know, we're on some kind of cloud and you're strumming a harp. No, God's redoing this earth. It was destroyed once by water. Second time it's going to be by fire, but there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. All right? It's going to be populated. God's going to rule this planet. All right? And uh, in fact, you can see, you'll read the end of Revelation. The description is very similar to what the Garden of Eden was. And there's going to be people with responsibilities. Our rewards are responsibilities in his kingdom. All right? And he's telling Timothy, if you're faithful now, God's going to see that faithfulness, and you're going to reap rewards in heaven. We're going to reign. Can you imagine that? I mean, I don't know about you. You know, people talk about the mansions. That I'd be satisfied to live in a shack in the corner. All right? But it says we're going to reign with him. He says, Timothy, don't get so dejected you got a great future. And so, again, God was ministering this to me that I would be able to finish, all right, that tough mission trip. And uh, God is ministering to Timothy here that he can go on, and he did go on. And my challenge to all of us, you know, we listen to what Matt is preaching about. Things are going to get, things are difficult now. Things are going to get more difficult. But I got to remember, Christ is my strength. I don't have to do this by myself i got to remember, all right, the five needs of my life. i got to continually be discipled that I'm growing. i got to multiply myself and others that we can serve together. I'm not serving alone. i got to endure trusting His grace. I have to keep my focus on Him and submit to His Word each and every day. And then i got to need to see the joy before me. Don't miss the blessings that He brings my way every day. Understand that's just a foretaste. I picked that one peach or one tomato, but there's a whole other harvest coming. God, you, we see little blessings here and there. We can't imagine. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him.
you can't even imagine, Timothy, what's waiting. And your labor is not in vain. And you will reign with him. And let that be, you know, our strength. That, hey, difficult days will come. But I got a God who's more than sufficient. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. I don't know what's going on in your life. Like I said, I was really, God, God literally gave me this message on the side of a bed. And I wrote it down as I was perspiring. All right, in a little notebook. But maybe you're going through something just, just, just like me. And you end up, we end up going, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can get through this. There, and, and we start, all these thoughts come into our mind. Maybe you need to hear this message this morning. And maybe you need to come as we do this invitation. That you just need to bow your, your head before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to endure, keep my focus on you. And I'm going to serve you. Maybe you need to do that this morning. Maybe this morning you don't know him and you need to come and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. But whatever the need is, respond to that. React to truth. React to his word. Let me have everyone stand. Everyone stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around. Let me ask as an invitation is played, if God has spoken with your heart, you desire to come to this altar, we want to give you this opportunity as we do each and every Sunday. Let his will be done in your life this morning.